you're based in Dubai, you know, you've got a very good visibility over the Middle Eastern market. What makes you so bullish on that market? It's an enormous ecosystem. It's nuts. Europe, it feels like it's sort of a little bit behind and a bit maybe complacent. And I just feel like the startup scene here, it's not what it, what I expect. This is London, for goodness sake. The amount of attention and time the founder gets from an investor is very, very short. And that leads to a whole bunch of other problems. Things are shifting dramatically. I'm sitting in the Middle East. Wow. If you want to see changes and a shift in power, come and sit here and see what's going on. It's absolutely unbelievable. Hello, I'm Sami Arya. I'm a tech philosopher and the founder of Impeak. In today's podcast, I sit down with Derek Watson, the founder of N2 Technology and Fusion42, a community of startup founders and investors. Derek is particularly well-connected in the UAE startup scene, and he's building an awesome community over there. If you are a founder in the region, you should definitely follow his work on LinkedIn. This was a super insightful conversation that I hope you enjoy as much as I did. Derek Watson, really a big pleasure to have you here. I, I heard so much about the great stuff that you're doing. Today, we just started on this conversation talking about family offices because I'm going to a family offices event in New York. Um, I don't even know what I'm exactly trying to get out of it. You know, it's a long trip, a commitment, a big commitment to, to go, but it's, an, it's a space that I'm exploring. So we were just talking about, before I press record, you were telling me a little bit about what you think the family offices thesis is when it comes to startups. So we are going to come to that. That's, we can park that uh, for a second. Why don't you start by telling people uh, who you are? What is Fusion uh, 42? What, what are the things that you're doing? So, hi. Thanks for having me, obviously. Um, it was a really enlightening, fun, entertaining conversation we had previously. So, really happy to be doing this again. Um, yeah, so I started my career uh, way back. I was a trader for a big American bank, a uh, prop trader. For, fortunately, it took me around the world. I worked out of Tokyo, worked out of Zurich, and then back to London. Um, and at the end of the 90s, I started the hedge fund, and that took me to Geneva in Switzerland, and we were sponsored by uh, a South African group. Um, and after a few years, headed out on my own <clears throat> with all the sort of ideas, I want to be my own boss and all of that nonsense, which I quickly learned is, is not quite as glamorous as I thought it might be. Um, it's really hard work. Um, and across that journey of, of that hedge fund, um, there's quite a few things I can look back at and see the similarities of, of, you know, a startup. It was a startup. It's just a different product at the end of the, at the, end of the day. Um, but the banking, the banking side, the hedge fund side, I'd been deeply involved in technology all the way along that. I mean, it was one of our, our cutting edges, I would say, as, as a proprietary trading group within the bank. Um, and when I got to start my own my own shop, it was really our USP was building technology and really getting deeply into it. Um, this is pre-cloud, having a big server room with your amount of Dell machines all whirring away, um, building algorithms just to take the weight off our shoulders in terms of trading, um, plugging everything in from risk management systems to you know our prime brokerage accounts, just trying to make our lives more efficient, create more time so we could do more interesting things. And along that, we started investing through different pockets of, of um, different vehicles and different pockets of uh, assets that we have in, in startups as well. Um, majority sort of European based, um, working with great founders, really interesting, geeky people that just made, made really interesting stuff happen. Um, and I was like a kid in the candy store, whether that was working with founders on one side or building technology for, for my business on the other side. It was just enlightening. It was fantastic. And you could just accelerate stuff uh, and take efficiency to a much bigger level. Then obviously, you know, the great financial crash came along, shook the world up, shook us up. Uh, and after a few years, we, we started some, some other things within that period, survived it. Um, but sort of my desire, love, interest in sort of sitting at the front end of capitalism um, kind of waned, kind of disappeared, actually. Uh, it just wasn't interesting anymore. 
Um, and in 2012, I sold the public market side of the hedge fund business to my partner, and I carried on with all the private market side of it. Um, and the, the real reason I moved to Dubai in 2014 was I, I was kind of a little bit sick of European bureaucracy. If it, it was, yeah, a little bit bored of life over there, um, turning up to have meetings where the answer starts with a no. Um, and then you have to work to a maybe, and it was just too long. And I spent some time in the region before because we had investments here. Um, and it was just, you know, it was bullshit like in every ecosystem. But at least it starts off with, yes, we can. Uh, and that's a really nice, positive mindset um, to start with, and then to make things happen and progress. Um, so that's the main reason for, for being here. Then at the end of sort of... Uh, 2017, 2018, um, after working with all these founders, helping them raise capital, sitting on their boards as board advisor, et cetera, um, I started investigating, looking at how can, we, how can we make these transactions easier, coming from a sort of highly regulated market, um, where when you raise capital, it's by the book. There's not, a lot of, um, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. You have to be very, very careful. Regulated entities, we were SEC regulated, um, so you know the rules, you play by the rules, and it really is just your USP that stands out and makes the difference. You really have to prove yourself with traction, with ability um, to, to raise capital. Um, and it's all objective. And that's kind of what I wanted to do for, for the venture capital market, is just to make it objective after having spent time raising, trying to raise capital and trying to help founders. Um, and then trying to just match up who's who in the ecosystem. And unfortunately, the way it sort of seems to be, one, there's a lot of people in the middle, which makes it very messy, not to use another swear word. Um, <laughs> makes it a bit convoluted and a bit, yeah, messy. Um, and then just changing, putting the horse back in front of the cart a little bit, you know. When you go out as, as a professional money manager, you do have a thesis. You're raising from LPs at the end of the day. You don't go in there and go, we invest in fantastic, amazing, world-changing founders. That's our thesis. A bit of serendipity and a bit of gut feeling. Off we go. You don't say that at all. You say, we're investing in X, Y, Z in this region with this ticket size, for a portfolio of this size, yada, yada. That's how it works. So why don't we start a conversation with founders based on what we actually know, which is this. And we don't have hour-long conversations with founders that end up with, you're too early. We kind of should have known that before I came in the room and explained what I'm doing. Or we don't invest in SaaS. Well, you kind of know that before I pitched up and told you. So there's a lot of that bullshit that goes on. And I just really wanted to change it round. And for two reasons. One, a lot of lessons, a lot of learnings along the way. Um, but for two reasons. One, because of the amount of attention and time the founder gets from an investor. It's very, very short. And that leads to a whole bunch of other problems, which is like, you've got to write your pitch book in this way. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. loads and loads of advice, which sort of puts all the onus to a large degree on the founder who's never done it before. But he's the one responsible to do all the outreach, do all the language, do absolutely all the work because of their inefficiency in how their sort of pipeline and funnel looks. So that's really what we're, we're trying to do here. So we built N2, which does that um, very efficiently. Um, but then there was a whole bunch of other learnings that came in. And those learnings were essentially that founders get very uncomfortable at that stage of outreach. And they get uncomfortable because they're not sure about what they should be saying and doing, whether they're good enough, far enough in their journey, whether they're giving the right KPIs, whether so all of that language. And that's why we created Fusion 42, which is a community for startup founders. We've brought together, oh, it's about 16 different experts, mentors, people that really have been punched in the face, um, been around the block, know what they're doing. And we're not there to tell startup founders how to run their business, what to do. We're there for those moments where you sit there and start procrastinating as a founder going, Oh, should I do that? Ooh, should I go in that direction? What's the, you know, and it's like a one off event a lot of the time. It's just, how should I do this today? I don't need to learn this for, you know, the, the next 10 years of my life. I just need to answer something today. And that's why we make ourselves available. And it's literally just get on there, ask a question, and it'll be, you know, Bob, how do I do this? 
well, I've tried A and I've tried B. A worked for me. Give it a go. If it doesn't work, I'm sure there's someone else here that can help you out. And if we don't know, and that's, you know, really the big message to all the um, experts in all the channels. If you don't know, please don't Google it. Please don't just give them some random advice that you've Googled yourself. Only do it if you have in-depth in knowledge. Everybody can Google. Everybody can use chat GPT. We're here to give real insights, real actionable insights to get these, to get shit done, essentially, without all the rubbish that goes with it. Yeah, I I, uh, I can give an example. The other day in the chat, uh, somebody was asking about getting paid in Bitcoin uh, for investment. And um, I shared that we got investment in, in crypto in the past and, and how we did it. Um, and and um, that's not the kind of thing that you want to Google and respond. You know, you really want to talk from experience. So, so this is a great. Yeah. So so uh, this is a community that you are uh, currently building um, uh, with the people that are in your network and, and you're you're growing it. But your actual business, your main business is is N2, right? That's the that's where you're. That's the, that's the main business. That's the main concentration. Um, Although <laughs> the community, um, in typical startup founder fashion, I woke up one Saturday morning and went, oh, I got an idea. This will be helpful. Let's build a, instead of building a horizontal, let's build a vertical, um, you know, sort of mentorship advisory based on when founders need information and not based on when I'm willing to give information. Uh, and I did that. And, uh, you know, uh, it's been a good learning. Um, I now know what the job of community manager means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a very difficult job. It's a hell of a job, isn't it? Policing. Yes, it is. We did that sticking. in Web3. And yeah, it's, it's... Oh, it's unbelievable, isn't it? And I'm, I'm a member of quite a few of these. And one of the things I always found, you know, you learn from what you perceive as the mistakes of other people. Um, and it does take an awful lot of time and energy. And you do sometimes, I feel like I sometimes come, on, come across as a grumpy old police man. Because like, don't do that, don't spam, don't do that, and, and setting it out. Um, but the interesting thing I found is that that happened a few times, but the quality just went up immediately. Well, well, once people realize what we're actually trying to accomplish, what the mission is, what the vision is, and the value that we can actually give, if each of these things isn't full of a whole bunch of you know promotional nonsense, everybody just trying to look after themselves and leverage on the hard work of building community and then go, oh, do you want to buy this from me? Um, once they realize that's not the purpose. And in fact, we, we designed a promo channel. Go for it. Do whatever you Sell all your shit on there. We don't care. Just get in there and do it. But don't do it in the other channels that aren't appropriate for it. Keep those clean. Keep those for what their purpose is and what they should serve. Yeah. Um, and, and since then, that policing, I mean, it was horrible for a few weeks. It was really horrible. Um, but since then, people have picked up. And now to qualify, um, you know, we were sort of letting people in. Whoever applied, we just let them in. And now every Friday I do a call. Um, every, everybody that shows up to the call, they understand what the principles are and, you know, what our mission is, what we're really trying to serve. Um, and it's been great since then. It's been yeah, way, way better. How many people are in the community so far? Uh, I think we're up to about 700. I've probably thrown out about 100. Um, mm. naughty, Just, naughty people. Booting, uh, booting them out. <laughs> Some of them. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit more about N2. So uh, I had a look at your website. You know, I come across this business model quite a lot where somebody is like, I have a network. And I'm going to help you raise money. This is how much you pay in advance. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to, you know, look at my, my network and, and help try and raise. And it's so, uh, so hard to decide as a startup founder, it's quite a, a minefield and, and trying mm -hmm. to, to kind of explore and decide which of these to go with. There are usually somebody who's got a good network, but obviously everybody's network is uh, eventually limited in that they have you know a, a group of people that that uh, they're uh, you know that, that they know um, so as a startup founder what's your recommendation to somebody who is raising money and is trying to decide how to choose what, what one of these or, or whether or whether to to choose them like I've raised one and a half million dollars or 1.2 million pounds so far by myself 
uh, you mm -hmm. didn't use any of um, uh, this type of uh, services. But along the way, I've, I've always considered it. And there's been many times where I was like, would it really make my life easier? So, so tell yeah. me a little bit about that. Uh, so let's, let's, base yeah. it, let's base it on two things. I, I, I think the language of, of most of these sites is completely wrong and misleading. Okay, saying that it's a fundraising platform is not what we are at all. We do not raise funds for you because it's actually impossible as a third party to raise funds for anyone. There is no one sitting there going, here's a check, that's a great story. Can you pass it on to them? No, no, no. The founder has to be in the room. The founder has to sell the, sell the whole story, sell the whole vision. There is the objective side and the subjective side of this. One investor, 10 fintech founders, literally all doing the same thing with a slightly different squeeze of lemon, um, he will, that, 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 that investor will make a connection with one or two of them that he will actually believe in and probably invest in. Okay, but they're all roughly doing the same thing. So this sort of like, use our platform and race. No, 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 no. This is investor, this is investor relations. This is connecting you with the right investors. It's up to you to sell. We're not here to sell. We're here. So this is a time value proposition that N2 offers. And it is basically go on Crunchbase as a first time, second time founder, get a list of investors, try and work it out in your head, go onto Google and read a little bit more about it and then figure out if their thesis matches what you're doing, then try and reach them and then eventually try and get a meeting with, with them. Um, that's what, not what we do. We do all that heavy lifting. We, we do all that instantaneously and that's why we charge a fee because that's what we do and continuously match them, continuously give you as a founder the ability to highlight to those investors that are matched to you, um, what you're doing, what your next, every, every two weeks you can send out an update. You know, we've hit this KPI, we've got a lead investor or whatever that may be. Um, and that's what they're, we're, we're there for. And that's literally how I believe it should work in terms of um, qualifying the top of the funnel. And from an investor side, some of the, some of the better investor users that, that, that we have, their funnel is actually five times clean, cleaner and clearer that they receive from us. Obviously, the volume is down. And this is sort of another one of those learnings, the interplay between the two, you know, and the sort of open funnel that a lot of VCs have, anyone can apply. Why is it that's so against the, you know, the time value proposition? But then it takes you back and, um, to some of the rationale that, that's used because they're raising, they're raising money from LPs. And some of the stories are, of course, we get a thousand deals a week. Of course, we see the best deal flow just based on volume, which is complete nonsense. <laughs> complete nonsense. You know, I know you can't invest in a banana plantation in Timbuktu. So it might be one of the thousand, but it's straight out. There's no quality to it. So there, there's this leveling off. And I think, and what we see and what we hear the whole time is this is getting more and more and more data driven. And, and this will take this will start taking over um, the fun the, the fun um, process for sure. So you think that um, more and more VCs are going to uh, opt for working with uh, or, or considering founders that are coming through these warm introductions, basically. Yeah, I think that's exactly how, how, how it has to be. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. I think that I I found or I have spoken with found um, founders from all over the world that are doing amazing things. Um, you know, there are certain solutions that are great that they're, that they're, they're, they're built um, in certain locations. Absolutely. Uh, and that has to be part and parcel of the whole ecosystem. But there's also a, a, a lot of people in emerging markets building different things, uh, feet on the ground, mission driven, um, understand it exactly because they're living the pain every single day what needs to be built um, we see it with you know I work with Pakistan quite a lot we know what the problems are there but there are some unbelievable underlying dynamics that make that ecosystem really really interesting going forward and there's a lot of technology that's not available that we kind of disregard in our day-to-day -day lives now it's not available there and there's people building it for that for that ecosystem right now 
And it's nuts. And that ecosystem's different than the UK. That ecosystem's different than the US. There are 9 million farmers in Pakistan. I mean, there's a lot to be done all over the place. There are thousands of, of school kids trying to apply for, for university. It's it, an enormous ecosystem. It's nuts. Okay, price points are low. We understand all of that. But the tide is rising. You know, we, we sort of see from a sort of macro point, point of view. Things are shifting dramatically. I'm sitting in the Middle East. Wow. If you want to see changes and a shift in power, come and sit here and see what's going on. It's absolutely unbelievable, really. Talk to me a little bit more about that. So uh, you're based in Dubai. Um, you know, you've got a very good visibility over the Middle Eastern market. Um, what's your take? Uh, I mean, I originally come from Iran. So um, I, 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 it's a huge population. It's a huge young population. Um, yeah. And, and it, it's truly an emerging market. But like you said, the price points are low. It's a, it's a different culture. Um, what makes you so bullish, if, if you will, on, on that market? Um, for, for, for several reasons. Um, I'm trying, trying to pick the starting point here, which, which the best one is. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with something that's a little bit, probably slightly negative in a, in a sense. Um, when you come here, and lots of people have come here to raise capital, uh, they think it's like, you know, the Wild West, and we'll just come and raise some money because we're fabulous or whatever. It's a very different view here. Uh, it, they don't hand money over very easily. Um, the money that goes out and that you hear about, uh, it's all with a great purpose behind it. It's promotional. A lot of it is promotional. Uh, and you've got to remember places like the UAE, um, you know, they've made their money out of natural resources. They've made their money, especially in Dubai, out of real estate. Uh, and now they're focused on the future and what that future looks like. But remember, from a tech and a startup perspective, we are a bunch of startups sitting in a startup economy. It is Dubai is 20 years old, for goodness sake. I mean, it has such a big name, but it's still a startup. And they're making all those mistakes. They're doing all of those things. And, you know, a lot of the purposes, and a lot of the sort of uh, messaging that comes out are very self-serving. Um, but they've started picking up on that and they've started doing things in the right way. And they're really trying to build an ecosystem that, uh, that is for all to come and enjoy and benefit from uh, and not just that immediate boom. And then it, it's all over. It's trying to look at sort of sequential uh, um, funding processes and how they can all come together. Um, then you see uh, what Saudi's doing, which is insane at every single level. Um, they've attracted a lot of people into it, um, but it's very domestic at this stage, and they want to get sort of the internal domestic wheels working first um, before they start bringing in more and funding externally. But they have those mechanisms, and the PIF is just a machine, isn't it? I mean, it's enormous. What's the PIF? The and, and, and you said that the, it's very promotional, um, the way that they think about funding. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, it's all the sort of bright lights, bright lights in very come to Dubai, you know, come to, you know, um, Abu Dhabi, we've got, you know, $50 trillion waiting for you. So not true, but it will get people here. And, and underneath, there are a whole bunch of great initiatives that are going on. Um, the PIF is, the, you know, the, the public investment fund um, in Saudi has, has all the trillions of dollars that they have. That's what they yeah, that's what they're using to fund to fund all the football teams and all the football players they're they're buying. Um, so and it's fabulous and it is totally. So Saudi is a really really interesting case right now um, from from wanting to open up the sort of route between Eastern Europe. Um, I don't know if you saw that on the news, but they want to put the whole sort of trade um, going through them, um, which, which they'll accomplish um, from building neon. Um, this incredible city that they've got plans for, which has literally become the biggest R&D um, project on the planet. It's absolutely insane what they're trying to do there. Uh, yeah, and, you know, they're going to make shit happen. Uh, and, and we definitely see that there is a sort of, you know, high-level divide between East and West right now. Um, you know, it's expected that China's, China's um, GDP, and, you know, we can all make up of it what we what we want and we can all argue about it forever but the fact of the matter seems to be that the bright people in economics are saying that 
by 2050, the GDP of, of China will be maybe twice, maybe even three times that of the US. There is a huge change going on. And the Middle East at this moment in time sits right at the intersection of that and is playing an incredibly clever game of managing both sides. Okay? I mean, imagine this. The UAE is, um, Diram, is pegged to dollars, yet they're, they're open to joining the BRICS. They're playing a really clever game of sitting in the middle of all of this. And they will benefit from it because they built the infrastructure. It's the latest, greatest, newest infrastructure on the planet, right here in the Middle East. Uh, of course, you know, it's sort of Germany, Japan, after the Second World War, why did those economies boom? Because they were flattened and they built all these new economies on the best technology and the best infrastructure possible. So they had their moment in the sun. This is now old. Um, it's now incumbent. and you know, new places will pop, pop up. Uh, and I, I just truly believe that this is one of those places. Um, and, and from a technology standpoint and startup standpoint, um, I believe they really focused on it. Well, no, I don't believe, but I know, I see it every single day. Um, <clears throat> they're great at attracting talent here. It's a great place to work. Um, and as we know, tech really doesn't have any borders. So, you know, you can amplify it. Uh, and go global from here as well. We just need to start getting some of those bigger names to explode out of the region, uh, and off it goes. You know, it just it doesn't take much for that that snowball to start gathering some speed. Super interesting what you said about how the Middle East is sitting at the intersection of China and and the US. Um, you would have thought that that would be a role for Europe. But um, Europe, it feels like it's sort of staying a little bit behind uh, and, and a bit maybe complacent. Um, you know, I, I'm in London and I just feel like the level of, um, you know, the startup scene here, it's, it's not what, it, what I expect. Uh, you know, I, it, it, this is London, for goodness sake. You know, it's just like, it's good, but it's like, not flourishing the way that um, that that you would you would hope, um, and that's why I'm personally looking to either Middle East or San Francisco, and just trying to decide which way to go. So far, I'm leaning towards uh, SF, um, but I, I I also think that uh, it makes sense, given my Middle Eastern background, it makes sense to maybe have a presence in both you know, both uh, the West and the East uh, and, uh, you know, Middle East. So I'm considering, you know, having offices for our company, both in uh, the Middle East and, and in U US. Um, yeah. And uh, so for a forward reaching startup founder uh, that's building in, in the tech space right now, um, what's your suggestion you know, if they have limited resources and they're thinking, where can I best raise money? Where can I really expand my my market? Um, it, what's your recommendation if, if they had to choose between US or, or Middle East? In an actual physical location or well? Yeah, or physical just... location and, and building a market, raising money. Let me ask you this. The Middle Eastern investors, they do they expect you to have a presence there? 100%. Yeah, it's all about it's all about foreign direct investment here. I mean, the, you know, it's a growing it's startup in a startup. As I said, you know, it's a growing economy. They're trying to push as much as they have, as, as they possibly can to attract here, and that's why that sort of underlying resource that they're offering is so great. Because you know, I've been using the football analogy maybe maybe too much of late. <laughs> Just see what they're doing in in Saudi, but bit bringing in football players. In. How do you build that market? How do you attract? How do you attract people here? Um, I, I didn't think in my lifetime I'd ever be flicking onto Saudi sport and watching football. I didn't think that would ever happen. But now I want to see Ronaldo because he's great. So I'll put it on and I'll watch the highlights of what happened this weekend in Saudi football. So, you know, it, it is attractive and they're, they're doing a lot of the right things to, to do that. Um, as a startup founder in Europe, and it's, it's interesting what you said, said about Europe. I, I kind of now just package Europe and the US in the same. Although that I know they're different, I kind of package them in, in the same thing. And you just watch what's going on in, in, in Europe at the moment. It's kind of tough being a startup founder in Europe. 
it's kind of tough because of all the bureaucracy, all the form filling, all the shit you have to go through um, to do it. And to a large degree, I, I guess that rolls over into the UK as well, which just ha now has that extra trying to do business in Europe is, is kind of difficult as well. Um, so I, I, I think they're very focused on themselves. I think the US is focused on itself. Um, it's forgetting um, the rest of the world. It focuses on itself. It has so many, and Europe, Europe say, has so many internal arguments going on about what they should do and what they, that they're missing, that everyone else is like catching up and probably going to overtake them. Um, and I think that's the biggest problem. If I was a European founder right now, I'd, I'd be investigated heavily what I can do here. Can I find clients here? Um, can, I, can I make partnerships in the Middle East? I'd start doing that immediately. Why is that? Because of, of what I said earlier, it's going to be the intersection and it's booming and it's growing. Can I get a result immediately today in selling to Middle Eastern customers? No, it's tough. It's a tough market. The GCC is huge, but you've got to think, you know, Saudi, very rich, UAE, rich, Egypt, huge population, low price point. So it's very difficult to build a business model that will accommodate, um, you know, the whole of the GCC region in one go. So you do have to start and start branching out. Um, but, it, but again, I, I mean, this is so product related, right? So product related, whether, whether you, you reach out and niche down on exactly what the product is and reach out globally, or you have maybe a wider product and niche down on the customer focus. So it's one or the other. So it kind of sits where your product is. Uh, in, in terms of raising capital, right now for early stage startups, um, there's not a lot of pre-seed or seed money here, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of people looking at Series A, Series B here. There's more, more availability of cash for that. Um, but, but again, you know, the rules have changed. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Explain a little bit more about that. Why is it? Is it because the the culture of uh, startups there um doesn't quite exist in in or the risk taking um yeah so maybe the the risk appetite you think is it lower and uh, the reason why they're interested in series a series b is because there's traction already is that what they're thinking i think there's a little bit of de-risking at that level of course which people are interested in um you have to um, culturally understand so the family offices here let's you know go into that let's go into that sort of psyche how they've made their money over time you know oil and gas resource nothing to do with technology get it out of the ground sell it margin thank you very much okay um roi on building stuff real estate a totally different game so it's very hard, men, you know, from a mentality standpoint to cross over into binary kind of binary bets um, when the whole world, you read one thing about it, it's like, you got a 90% chance of losing all your money. Uh, I mean, it's not very attractive, is it, when you read all the bullshit rhetoric out there uh, about, about how, how startups work. Uh, and there's a lot more to, to it. And, I, you know, it's just a very nascent space here to a large degree. They want, they have the will uh, to, to, to want to build uh, and, and take that risk. Um, and it just takes time. Um, you know, we talk about risk tolerance and, uh, and what it is, and I often see this sort of big conversations about Europe, Europe, Europeans don't have any risk appetite, and the Americans do. Well, no, the risk appetite isn't different. It isn't different between Americans and Europeans. It's just nonsense. It's just Americans are incredibly good at fractionalizing money and recycling it. They're way better at doing it. Just look at the American banking system. They can take a dollar and change it into cents of cents of cents and recycle that and get it into the system. They're just incredible. They're monsters at recycling and fractionalizing money. And the Europeans aren't. It's not about risk appetite. It's about fractionalization of money. And whether we call that um, um, greed or we, or we call it being clever, who knows? Um, and does it really matter? But that, that's what the, the American and the US model, uh, the, the US and European model, that's the big difference. Tell me more about that. Talk, talk to me about, about that a little bit more. What, what do you exactly mean by US is better at fractionalizing money? Explain that a bit more. Okay. So in terms of lending to early stage, so they will, they will gather assets from, from more people they will funnel those through, they will offset risk, and they will lend them out again. So it's just the whole banking system working. 
Um, and they will build, we'll, we'll just let's take SVB. What a great example. SVB, okay, all blew up in the end. But just think how SVB's balance sheet looked and where that money came from. The same money from managers was getting put into founders who were then banking with them. They were using that money to fund other founders and background. So the same money is just going around the same ecosystem the whole time. And when it implodes, it implodes big time. Of course it does, because it's the same money. There's only one of it. We've just divvied it up and let everybody have a bit of action on the back of it. And everybody took a fee along the journey. Uh, and, you know, there's two, two sides to that. Of course, one, oh, my God, worst asset management rules ever in the world that, you know, a, a VC has not only his founders banking there, all his money there, all his management fee, all his risks tied up in one bank. I mean, let's just rule 101. Bunch of amateurs should never happen. But they can make more money out of it. And when, you know, when markets are going up, everyone forgets about the basic rules of asset management. And everybody is happy to just put on more risk, more risk and go, oh, yeah, that won't happen. Leave that. And then it does happen, right? And then everybody panics. And everybody goes, where's the government's fault? No, it's not. The rules are there. You know what they are. Do your job. As simple as that. So but that's where they are extremely good at doing this. And they do have, you know, they do have government bailouts all the time. You see that in every industry, right? Airlines all go bankrupt, the government come in. So, you know, it's not capitalism anymore. If you understand, if you, if you can leverage and get really, really big, the government will bail you out. So you've just changed the whole weight of, 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 of your business model. Um, so it, it, it is that race. It is that complete race now. So, and, and that's what I think they're incredibly good at. And they dress it up in an incredibly attractive way that makes us all want to do that. And it's great. It's super interesting. Uh, that's, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that's basically where the risk appetite is, is coming, uh, if you will, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Very interesting. Okay, so, so we established that there's not a lot of money for pre-seed and seed in the Middle East. Um, uh, generally speaking, if you are a very, very early stage startup and you're thinking about, you know, over, going over there, it's probably not necessarily the best move. Uh, that that's that's really interesting. Um, so you are right. just yeah, just a little caveat on that. I mean, there are there are sort of you know more incubators, more accelerators coming along as well with writing small checks. I know of a new initiative. Um, that, that, that's going to be opening hopefully in November, December time, which will be writing $100,000, $200,000 checks um, for that. So, you know, it's trying to build it up. It's just a little bit the sort of recycling of capital. Um, you know, we saw sort of 2016, 2017, a lot of money pouring in uh, at pre seed. Um, and sit, well, it was seed then, wasn't it, until we all decided there was this new term called pre seed. Um, so, a lot of money poured into that. And then as it grew up, you know, no, no more money. It was all supporting Series A and then supporting Series B. Um, so, that, you know, there's one amount of money. There's a limited amount of LPs here. That's the thing. Everybody's asking the same people for money, which are the big, you know, sovereign wealth funds here. Um, so, yeah, there are massive limitations on, on that side as well. Um, I do think and I do see an initiative, initiative that we're putting in place as well. There are an extreme, and I mean extreme, amount of high net worth individuals. So one of, one of the parts, the underlying part of fusion, the uh, community we're building, is to start, is to start, we have started, we made one investment, uh, an, angel, an angel network at the bottom of it. Uh, and the power of that is really because, because we have the diligence channels in place. So from, from just offering advice to, to founders, um, when we find those founders that, that look really, really interesting, we're going to start taking that into diligence level. And then we have a, what we've managed to create here is sort of 15 experts um, that can diligence on all of their expertise and bring that to an angel group at the bottom. I was talking to an investor the other day, uh, and he was like, you, you've built in, in 12 weeks or in 14 weeks since you started this community, You've built more resource and power of knowledge in it than most 300, 400, 500 million dollar VC funds. 
who've got maybe three or four analysts sitting there doing all of that work. You've got 15 experienced high-level analysts already. Uh, that's a bloody good idea, that is, because now we can leverage off all of them that speak on their specific, because it's not just about understanding, you know, um, what the problem and the solution, and you're nice and you're not nice. It's really about understanding where their head's at. And we've had some great conversations when it comes to next steps, what that roadmap, where they think the important value is for their startup and how they're taking it forward. And we're all about we're all about getting customers and getting paying customers and trying to, you know, part of that angel group, take take the weight of some of the the, the silly day-to-day tasks. Let's try and take that away from them. They don't need to be doing that. And, you know, between us, we've got enough time to to help them and accommodate and, you know, build those systems for them underneath. So they can just concentrate on product and selling it and customers. And just that that journey, that's all you have to do. You've had a great idea. Just go and get it in front of customers, get that feedback, iterate, make it better, get more customers. And we'll take we'll try and take care of everything underneath that um, so you don't have to waste time on it. And that's one of the most interesting parts uh, of the, the sort of community build so far. And back to the angel side or back to the pre-seed seed side, I see that as being the driver of, of the ecosystem here. Lots of rich people, lots of people that have come um, from business and independently wealthy through that business uh, and want to get involved in, in technology. So building building them, bringing them into this uh, investment community um, uh, with the overlay of, of two things, really. And that is a very candid way of explaining um, you're not here to be a tourist investor. You're not here to just invest in two things that a mate told you about that sound really glamorous and they're the next Uber or they're the next this or they're the next that. And it's all about you. No, you've got to invest in a diversified portfolio. It's really bloody hard to make money out of this. Um, and we're going to put everything we possibly can into it for using your network, leveraging on your network, leveraging on your time to bring your expertise into this as part of your commitment to investing as well. Because we want to raise the tide. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's re- really the main point. And I, you know, the more people I speak to in the region, the more I'm seeing that concentration going in that direction as well. There's a lot of money at that sort of base level in the region. And we can start pulling that in and writing, you know, pre seed, seed size tickets quite easily. Yeah, essentially building your own angel network. You're, that's what you're doing there, which is, which is really. Quite- yeah, I just want to do it on a more. Um, or probably get kicked in the face. Organized. Yeah, just more professional level. You know, yeah. the, 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 you know um, Angel Network in the US, you know, it's a great website, but it's brought a whole bunch of novices um, to run money at a perceived professional level. Uh, and it's not. There's, there's many things to this journey. Um, finding deal flow is one of them. Um, and pulling triggers and investing is just one part of this journey. Managing your investor money in the middle and using portfolio theory and applying that to understand where you can make a difference every single day. And that difference doesn't necessarily have to impact one underlying portfolio company. It's not like, oh, I know a guy that could buy some of his product or could help. No, it's not. It's about efficiencies at all the levels. It's about efficiently, um, efficiently managing cash exposure, understanding different things that are going on that you can move cash to the right place or maybe even hedge it for certain reasons. There, there are so many other things to do within managing a portfolio than just investing. And the other thing is, um, because it's such a long thing and you've got such a huge influx of, of new fund managers, if you like. And I, you know, I, I love the recycling and you know, a founder sells his company, he starts doing it, uh, starts investing. But it's a professional job in the middle. It's not just like invest, here, here's some money, off you go. There's a lot to do in the middle. But it's also, you know, there's three stages to this, invest, manage, and exit. And no one talks about what's your exit plan. It's one of the things that it's being spoken about in the region. It's one of the things that they're looking at, all the different, you know, the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange. How can we find, find how can a market be created that actually starts letting founders the starts saying VCs exit um, because we need to recycle capital at the same time. And those efficiencies are things that we see in big markets. 
we don't see them. So, you know, building this ecosystem takes an awful lot more than just like throwing money at the, uh, uh, you know, um, pre C founders. There's an awful lot more to do to, mm -hmm. to grow all the way through. Yeah. No, oh, super interesting. So tell me, um, uh, Derek, where can people find you? Where can they follow you? How can they uh, join your community? What's you can find you can you can find me on LinkedIn. I guess yeah, that's you're very active the, on LinkedIn. That's the easiest way. And then uh, they they can reach out. Like, how, how can they get in front of you if, if startups that want to join, or maybe even angel uh, investors that? Yeah. Want so I I mean you know we've got the n2.eco is is the platform. Um, super easy to find, super easy to get on, on there. Um, Fusion 42, you can find that through LinkedIn. We haven't really, you know, it's, it's 14 weeks old, I think. So there's nothing, you know, we haven't built anything really publicly available. Um, it's, it's pretty much been on invite only at this stage. Um, we went through that sort of um, policing and cleanup period. So we're going to kind of open the gates again and start, start working in as we, we find our feet and, you know, apply our learnings to it to make, to make it fundamentally better for everyone, um, and whether that be the people that are helping, mm -hmm. um, whether that be the founders, or whether that is creating the value for the angel investment group at the bottom, um, working hard to make that more efficient, uh, uh, more valuable for everybody. Amazing. Um, so, but I, I guess, you know, I, I mean, my, e my yeah. email is super easy. Huh? It's just Derek at n2.eco. Awesome, awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Derek. This has been super interesting. And of course, we are going to talk about maybe there are things that we could do in collaboration with each other. So hopefully we will um, smoothen that journey of people joining um, you know, what you're doing. Uh, so, Absolutely. so it's great. Thank you for being here. This was Thank a you so much. enlightening conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there'll be many more coming up. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Derek Watson. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcast so that you don't miss the future episodes. It will mean the world to me if you leave a review and share the podcast with other founders who you think may enjoy it.